It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Hey, everybody, this is Val, and I'm here with Steph, and we're answering David's requests for some more edumatainment on English wine this week. Hey, Steph. Hey, Val. And, you know, this is going to be an introductory overview of English wine because some people don't even realize that there is such an animal. And, you know, don't have any fear, okay? We still have the usual selection of all of our segments to keep things moving and fun. So, David, we hope this passes some muster for a high-level awareness because we know you're there on the island and you have access to this stuff. So please feel free to chime in with anything else we can add in the future. Leave us a speak pipe, and uh, we, we'll try to go deeper as we go forward. But let's start with what's in our glasses. Uh, Steph, did you want to start with yours, or do you want to start with me to start with mine? How about I'll start with mine, and then you can just take off from there. Okay, because I'm going to sip mine. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I'm almost <laughs> done. But, you know, I couldn't find any English wine up here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And so that's just too bad. I had to had to make a uh, dirty but not too dirty vodka martini because we just brought back this really cool bottle of vodka called Blue Duck Rare Vodka from New Zealand. And the reason why it's cool is for a couple of reasons. But blue ducks are an endangered rare bird in New Zealand. And this bottle has a blue duck on it, but they, the company gives part of their profits to help this endangered bird. But what's even cooler, and I think Val would think this is really cool, is that this is a vodka that's made from whey, a byproduct of the country's dairy industry. Whoa. So you don't usually see vodkas made from whey. And uh, I'm like, no way. That's way cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's way cool. But uh, it's, it's an extraordinary vodka and um, very smooth, distilled seven times. Probably one of the best vodkas I've ever had. There you go. Awesome. Down. I've teed you up. I actually got my hands on some English wine and who knew and I've had some English bubbly before I've had an English bubbly tasting and I went up to my favorite purveyor you know him as Dirk from the wine cellar and he's got this pupitra in his old world room and it's always got like champagne and franciacorta and really nice premium bubbles on it it had two different bottles two different styles of the Ridgeview sparkling wine from Sussex, England. So I brought home the Cavendish. This is actually the Cavendish 2014. It's a vintage brute. And it is from the Ridgeview Estate from Sussex, England. And this estate was only founded 22 years ago, believe it or not, in 1995. Uh, the Cavendish, it's got that really interesting yeasty thing. That was the first thing I got on the nose was that toast and that like brioche bread thing and it's made with Pinot Noir, Meunier and Chardonnay, the classic grapes and actually we're going to talk more about how important those grapes are to English wine but this is a really nice mouth filling bubbly it was not overly expensive I think somebody asked me what it cost earlier and I thought it was around 60 but now that I think about it, it maybe more around $40 it is not an overly priced okay. bottle at all I can't remember the price of it but your market is going to determine that anyway but but yes, I am, uh, I am celebrating this episode with a nice English fizz today. Lucky you. I know. I feel so lucky, you know, because sometimes I can't find anything and I have to order it online when, when I could. <laughs> Colorado. <sighs> but I was really happy to be able to find this. Yeah. So should we get into it? I think it's time. I think it's time to do the overview because not very many people know about winemaking in England. You know, it's really surprising how many people I run into and don't even realize that England makes wine. And 
they've been making wine on and off for hundreds of years and you can thank global warming for some of the uh, winemaking that's happening now and I even listened to a discussion today by a climatologist it's reasonable that you could have some vineyards up in Glasgow you know in the next couple of decades so for now we got to keep in mind that England is a series of islands. It's in the middle of the sea. It's cold. It's windy. It's damp. It's foggy. I heard conversations today about ground frost versus air frost. And, you know, it was really crazy. And I remember that stuff, you know, walking through. It looks like you're walking through this ice crystal fog. However, what podcast were you listening to today? That was oh, the UK Wine Show. Oh, OK. Good. Yeah, the UK Wine Show. I love that show. And there was a conversation with Alistair, and I cannot remember his last name, but he's a PhD climatologist. And it was so, so interesting. It really got in the weeds about weather and wine. And then he started talking about Brexit and grap on things. But there were about like three or four episodes I listened to on the way to my dentist appointment, believe it or not. <laughs> So, yes, I'm pairing the English bubbly today with fluoride. However, back to England. <laughs> Two-thirds of, yeah, two of English wine production is actually sparkling. And most of that is produced in the classic method. And if you're not a new listener, then well, classic method means it's fermented in the bottle in which it is purchased. Just like a champagne, just like the cava we talked about last week. But we should add, to be classified as English wine, the wine has to be made in UK wineries meaning on UK soils from grapes that are grown in either England or Wales. Otherwise, it's just British wine. And by just British wine, I'm not trying to be snobby. I'm just trying to say that this is wine that's made in the UK, but the grapes or the juice can be brought in. From anywhere. From other places. Yeah, they can be. Yeah, they can buy in the concentrate. They can buy in the grapes. And these wines tend to garner lower prices. They're not considered wine by the EU definition of wine production. A lot of them tend to be sweet, but it's just considered kind of one of those bottom tier, not a quality product. However, only 5% of English wine is exported for now. And so don't feel bad if you can't get your hands on it or if you didn't know about it, because this is on track to change over the next few years. But it is really interesting that we're starting to find more and more information. And so we kind of had to round up a lot of stuff to put this together for you guys today. Yeah. And, you know, even though I couldn't find any up here in northern Colorado, um, in my neck of the woods, I, I feel pretty confident that it'll be up here very soon because obviously Val has some in Colorado Springs, but you know they're predicting that by 2020, it'll be 25% will be exported. So that's a huge difference. So you're saying if we can find it in Colorado Springs, you can find it anywhere because, you know, <laughs> loose chickens. <laughs> That's on paved funny. roads. That's funny. <laughs> There's probably worse places to shop for wine than Colorado Springs and Fort Collins, <laughs> but you know. Uh, anyhow, so back to back to the timeline here. So when we go about the history of English wine roots and modern winemaking, really kind of picks up in the 1950s. Even though there's you know historical accounts of vineyards, and they even found like amphora way way back you know in the day thousands of years ago but there are some vineyards that date back to the 18th century that are still active today such as the Painshill Place in Surrey did I say that right it's either Paines Hill or Painshill Painshill could be Paines Hill no Paines Hill or Painshill Paines Hill somebody in England please correct that for us that's Apparently, right. we don't speak English here. We don't speak English. <laughs> we, we speak American. That's true. <laughs> That's true. We speak American. American and English are two different languages. Let's just get that out there. Okay. That's right. That should have been a disclaimer at the very beginning of the show. America. But so back to history here. So before that, however, we'd have to time travel back to nearly a thousand years to find a real viticultural boom there's also a lot of discussion to be had regarding the climate. Yeah, because the climate like went from, wow, climate changed for like 300 years and was really awesome. And then for 600 years, it went back to the wet, yucky, cold weather. You know, so it does go back and forth in history, which is kind of uh, surprising to me that, you know, there could be that much climate change. But so so let's kind of finish this off with this 
the revival, really, which began in the mid 20th century, because that's when all of this good wine started happening. And the first modern vineyard was planted in Hambleton in 1951. And then in the 80s, the 1980s, is when oak aging of wines became popular. But bottle fermented bubbly like Val is drinking was also getting a toehold then too. So I just really want to get to the bubbly because that's if it's two thirds of production, that's really what we want to talk about here. So we often offer a nod to the British for stronger bottle glass. And we've talked about that before on the show because that's partially responsible for cutting back on the exploding bottles in the champagne era of the 17th century back in episode 84. We talked about that. Also, remember there's a story of Christopher Merritt who shortly before that created fizz on purpose. That's right. The Champenois were making champagne by accident. They thought it was evil spirits making that second fermentation wake up in the spring and causing that, you know, hand-blown bottle glass. It wasn't really regulated to explode. But we have to thank the English for, I think it was James I who banned wood fires and people had to start making bottle glass with coal-fired fires, and this gave a strength to the bottle glass. So this is where a lot of people credit the English. However, it seems that the British have, several hundred years later, been recognized for producing their own met- classic method sparkling wines, and, and we really celebrate that, of course. Now, the even though the the 50, the 60s and 70s, I've seen a website that said the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of English bubbly. expansion. Yeah, produced, yeah. But actually, when I consulted Christie's, uh, Champagne and Sparkling Wine Revised and Expanded, it's a world encyclopedia of champagne and sparkling wine by Tom Stevenson and Essie Avalon. This is my w- weather-worn go-to book on bubbly. But in there, it mentions that the first bubbly was produced in English vineyards in 1976. Make of that what you will. My take on it was England was celebrating getting rid of their colonial cousins 200 years or so before that. But Ridgeview, <laughs> Ridgeview, the winery I'm sipping on right now, that one was founded in 1995. Nytimber is another famous one you're going to hear about. That was founded in 1996. However, Nytimber is also credited for helping draw a lot of attention to English bubbly. And they had a classic cuvee at the 2009 Italian Bolucini del Mondo, which means Italian Bubbles of the World competition for sparkling wines. And it was their 2003 classic cuvee, apparently, that won them an award and started drawing attention to English bubbly. And I was actually in Italy when that happened. And I remember reading about this English bubbly. And then I started reading about Russian champagne and things like that. And I was like, oh, this stuff exists, but I'll probably never see it. However, in 2011, Ridgeview, the producer I'm drinking now, came crashing onto the world wine scene with their 2007 Gros Fenor Blanc de Blanc at the Decanter World Wine Awards. And so now it seems that England is doing what they know works for their climate, what they what works for their soils. And this explains why sparkling wine does make up 66% of the wine made in the UK. And I just get so excited about it. And I just can't wait until more of it's available. But there are wine regions, right, Steph? Yeah, there's seven of them. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, there's over 500 vineyards and more than 130 wineries. And they're all there in the south. And and also, if you can think about it, a lot, most of the wine regions of the world are between 30 and 50 degrees latitude. And so these, these are actually at right above 51 degrees. So you can see why their climate is so different. So starting with these seven regions, East Anglia, that is where Cambridge is, Suffolk, and uh, it's relatively flat and windy there. Then moving over to the southeast region, this area is referred to as the Garden of England and has some of that chalky soil that Chardonnay really likes. There's also uh, in that area is Surrey, Kent, Sussex, some of these places you've heard of before. This is where Ridgeview is located as is Plumpton College and Nye Timber. 
Um, also, Chapel Down is here and contains a vineyard founded in 1979 by Master of Wine, Stephen Skelton. He is known for his uh, books. So um, his book, Viticulture, An Introduction to Commercial Grape Growing, that as Val says, is practically mandatory for all diploma students. But he uh, he also has some uh, guidebooks, too, that um, he periodically updates with a new edition. And then, of course, we've got Southwest, which is home of Gloucester and the famous Cotswolds, which is actually near where I used to live. I used to go down there all the time. And this was about 25 years ago. So wine was not on my wino radar by then. We were getting a lot of German wine. It was my first introduction, like Spedlese or Auschleser, and that's all I knew. Everything else was wild turkey. And unfortunately, I mean, you know, (laughs) I didn't I didn't appreciate bourbon for what it was back then. Let's just put it that way. Also included in the Southwest is Avon and Cornwall, as well as the Republic of Ireland. Here we'll also find Camel Valley, which was founded in 1989 and considered one of the best wineries in the UK. Uh, Mercia which includes uh, Yorkshire. And I think if you remember that Joe Fatterini, who was on the show last year, he's a Yorkshireman. Staffordshire, Warwickshire, and uh, the Scotland wineries, I think, fall into this character, uh, this category as well. And Wessex includes the Isle of Wight, Dorset, and the Channel Islands. And the Thames and Chilterns, this is where you'll find Oxford, which is west of London. And this is actually where I used to live. And apparently I used to live near these vineyards and didn't even realize it. So that was really... Tragedy. I know. I had no idea. And this was in the early 90s. And I lived there for three years. And I should be ashamed of myself. Wales, of course, is its own region. And I do believe there are parts of Wales that are considered... uh, That can be part of, I want to say, the Southwest. But I I cannot remember if that's correct. But Wales is actually... The country of Wales is its own wine region. So there are different regions there. They all have different soils, weathers, wind exposures, and of course, little climactic influences. But it is interesting to know that they are developing the terroir conversation as time goes by. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, wine students and uh, wine lovers in general will eventually come to know and familiarize themselves with these areas as soon as we start seeing the wines available you know these things will be start being uh, more commonplace i think but for right now it seems like whoa you know what's funny is i went through my bubbly binder (laughs) i have Mm -hmm. one from when i went through the diploma and the whole there's a whole unit for on sparkling wines argentinian sparkling wines austrian sparkling wines the whole sec the whole thing not a single peep about British sparkling wines when I went through the diploma, which was not too long ago. Right. I was like, where are my notes on English bubbly? Nope. I didn't have any. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's when I got my credentials, everything I was studying uh, didn't have have any requirements to learn English wine at all. And and then all of the references and resources that I have in print if they mention it at all, it's a, it's like a one-off kind of like, oh, and by the way, and nothing really informative. Yeah, it's kind of like they have wine, kind of like depending on the resources you look at. Oh, yeah, America has wine besides California and Oregon and Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so what about yeah. the grapes, Steph? The grapes are really interesting. Well, and the big ones to really think about, because remember, two-thirds of the wine is sparkling, but about half of all the vineyards are planted with Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. So that kind of makes sense. But there's also some red grapes to make still wines or rosés, Gamay, uh, Rondo, Regent, Dornfelder, and Triumph. Uh, then there's white grapes. Uh, the most popular one behind Chardonnay is Bacchus, Sable Blanc, Reichensteiner, Muller Turgau, and many aromatic varieties such as Madeleine, Angevin, Ortega, Schoenberger, and this is where this tongue twisting stuff happens. Uxelribe, among others. I think that's good with your American accent, girl. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> 
I foreboded and I still have a hard time. Besides sparkling wine, there's also some cool climate styles of wine produced. So it's not all about the bubbly, but as you know, it's mostly about the bubbly. But there are lighter reds, but these only account for 10% of wine production along with rosé. So just lump red and rosé together in that 10%. White wines comprise less than a quarter of the wines produced in England, about 24%. And they do vary in style from dry to sweet. However, there are late harvest and dessert style wines. And anybody who's been there can tell you that noble rot can possibly happen because you've got an island surrounded by water and you've got (laughs) rivers and things. It is not unimaginable that you can have that low hanging fog in the morning to allow that noble rot to start to develop. The sun burning it off can be another thing, you know, but it can happen over there. So you can have the noble rot wines and you can have a lower alcohol wine over there because of the cooler climate. You're also going to have a higher acidity that's consistent with the cooler growing areas. So it's really interesting. I used to live there and I remember writing home back before Internet. And I remember writing home. We had summer last week. (laughs) And that was it. (laughs) Really? You know, but I did love it. It was it was probably one of the most memorable three years that I've spent living overseas. So I loved it. But you can also learn more. And I've I've just recently found this website here, Bibendum. I thought that was really cool. They talk about the 2017 harvest, Bibendum Wine uh, Company UK or Bibendum Wine UK. There's the English Wine Producers, and you can follow them at English Wine. Uh, UKVA.org. The Drinks Business has some great articles there. And then, of course, you can't not go ahead and stalk Stephen Skelton, MW. He's an authority on UK wine. And, of course, if you want to learn more, you can actually order the vineyard map that I have here from EnglishWineProducers.com. Don't forget Christie's World Encyclopedia of Champagne and Sparkling Wine because that's a great resource to read about the different producers in here that we didn't even mention today because there are, you know, a couple hundred of them. So what about a factoid? And I think Bibendum, I think I've been following them on Twitter and they have... They've been doing some podcasting, too. Really? I think so. Cool. Yeah. Shout out. So let's go on to the factoid. This doesn't have to do with wine, but in a way, it's kind of connected to England. Uh, But the term proof, when you're referring to the strength of a spirit, where does that come from? You know, I thought, this is a good little factoid. And I had just recently was in the audience of a SWE Society of Wine Educators webinar about American whiskey. And Russ Kempton was talking about this. And I thought that our wine two fivers would enjoy this little bit. So the word proof dates back to 16th century England when higher strength liquors were given an extra tax. Go figure. So the proof or the test, if you will, of a distilled spirit was determined by combining equal amounts of whiskey and gunpowder and then applying a flame. And only when the flame burned evenly with a blue flame was it, quote, proofed or measured as strong and then therefore taxed. But when the gunpowder failed to burn, then it's considered too weak. And conversely, when it burned really brilliantly, it was determined to be very, very strong. And as you might know, or maybe you haven't noticed, but in the U.S., our bottles of spirits will have the proof and the alcohol by volume ABV on it. And the proof is always twice that of the percentage of alcohol. But most other countries don't do that. They just usually have the alcohol by volume on their labeling. Yeah, I think for us, we'll see it on rum, we'll see it on bourbon, like 120 proof, which would be 60% ABV. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. we have a couple down there. And then you have to do math, people, so stay in school. (laughs) Oh, shoot. I think this is a good time to move on to our shout out. It is. I was so excited to find out that we have a new listener, or in his words, a fan club member, or didn't he say super fan? I think I called him a super fan, and he said he was honored to be called a super fan. (laughs) Phil, dude, you are a super fan, and he's in Florida. We thank you for reaching out to us. He sent us a lovely email and said, 
Dear Stephanie and Valerie, I'm a fairly longtime wine aficionado, almost 25 years of being a wino, but I'm a new listener to your podcast, having just found your wonderful show this past week. You two really do a great job and a very professional job and just find listening to your podcasts are very enlightening and relaxing. You two have a really great chemistry. Keep up the great work. And we think that's awesome. So thank you so much, Phil. We are going to raise our glasses to you and everybody listening right now. Cheers. Cheers. And then we are also going to raise our glasses to the Patreon love while I sip my second glass of this yes. Ridge View. You enjoy your Ridge View. Mm. I'm going to thank all of our patrons who support us on our crowdfunding platform called Patreon. And to our tenacious tasters, Jeff E. from the award-winning We Like Drinking podcast, Lynn from Savor the Harvest blog, Sebastian of Sassy Italy tours, Jen in Maryland, David and Lisa in Illinois, Anne Marie in Virginia, and our It's Not Five O'Clock and We Don't Care listeners, Meg in South Dakota, Clay in Arizona, John, Andrew, and Iswani in California, Chantel in Canada, Mary Lou in Pennsylvania, Kathy in Georgia, Chris, Janet, and Diane in Colorado, Stephen Renee in Illinois, Kathy in Tennessee, Ashley in North Carolina, Sean in Ohio, and our Tastemaker listeners, David in Scotland, who suggested this episode. It's all your fault, David. That's right. David, you're the one to blame. <laughs> and Carol in Kentucky and our Tastemaker listener, Karen in California. So you can go to our Patreon page to find out more, patreon.com forward slash wine two five podcast. And there you can find out about all of the reward levels that gets you swag, exclusive content, and we do have monthly drawings for our patrons. That's right. And you know what else we have for our patrons? We aren't trying to scare you away. If you're still listening right now, we aren't trying to scare you away. But we did scare up a video of a basement performance of the EP or no, the extended version of the Wine to Five rap. This is this is ridiculous, but it is what happens when Val and Steph drink and we rap and we get down and against our better judgment, we're going to make this available only to patrons. I can't believe we're doing They're this. They're so lucky. <laughs> At the $2 month level or higher, we're going to put this out on March 1st. So you still have time to get in there before March 1st. If you want to see this, it's what, about two minutes? There's yeah. a backbeat. <laughs> There's Steph, and I'm not going to give it away, but she's dancing up a storm. Uh, and uh, yeah, talk about embarrassing wine stories. We're here to humiliate ourselves just for you. We're also here each and every week. Guys, you can connect with us between episodes. You can find us on the social spaces at wine 25 And we encourage you to join our private Facebook group called wine to five community you can connect with me val on twitter i'm at wine gal on boxed i'm a little bit snarky but you can handle it i'm also on the vino with val facebook page instagram and every once in a while pinterest but you can connect with steph everywhere she's online as the wine heroine so until next week everybody cheers, cheers. thank you for listening to the wine to five podcast be sure to check us out at facebook slash wine two five and tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips.